perception, such a melodic word, and yet one so potentially lethal. Pondering it, I turned to the author Aldous Huxley, the father of such works as Brave New World and The Doors of Perception. According to Huxley, there's the known, the unknown, and between them lie the doors of perception. What do we know? What don't we know? And why does it matter? Well, it only matters, and my perception will only change if it helps me. Because let's face it, self-interest rules. <laughs> so I have two points today. One. Self-interest can be good and consistent with enlightened self-interest. A change in my perspective can be good, not just for me, but even for people I don't even know. So here's my story. I am a gay black woman who became an army officer, lawyer, executive, and now musician. I've thought a lot about perception through the lens of my life journey. Thirty years ago, I got a powerful lesson in perception. I was a young army officer on temporary duty in South Africa. Apartheid was alive and well, Mandela still in jail. And while there, I met a civil rights activist who happened to be ethnically Indian. During the course of our conversation, he referred to himself as black. I'm sure, responding to my surprised expression, he explained. The oppressor in South Africa, the Afrikaner government, maintained its power in part by pitting oppressed groups against each other. Black was a unifying term for the oppressed. It didn't matter whether you were Zulu, Koza, colored, or Indian. To be oppressed was to be black. Now, if I'm an oppressed South African, in order for me to buy in to being black, I have to walk through two of Huxley's doors. The first door is a change in how I see myself. The second door is I need to change how I see others. By walking through both of Huxley's doors, Oppressed South Africans helped bring down apartheid. I've come back to that conversation many times because as a gay black woman who became an army officer, lawyer, executive, and now musician, how I see me can be different from how others see me. Honestly, how I see me can be different from how I should see me. I was 
a closeted gay person the first 12 years of my career. Gay people are what I perceived it meant to be gay. Was frightening to me. And of course, it was career ending and or criminal to be a gay army officer in the 1980s. And I now understand the emotional gymnastics I went through to just not go there. It was in my self-interest to just not go there. Even after I left the Army and moved to so-called liberal Seattle, for all practical purposes, I was closeted for another eight years. The shame, the stress. Have you ever had a secret you held so tight inside you that it made you ill? Have you? Have you? For me, it took a job offer from Texas, no less, for me to come out of the closet. You see, my, my partner had to give up her job and health benefits for me to take the job. So I came out as gay to strike the best deal possible with a new employer for myself and my family. Motivated by self-interest, I found my true self amongst the tech gods, barbecue, and Willie Nelson of Austin. <laughs> By the time we returned to Seattle, I knew I could never return to the closet. But I also wanted to be gay on my terms. I know what Sam Smith, the singer, means when he says, I don't want to be known as Sam Smith, the gay singer. I want to be known as Sam Smith, the singer, who happens to be gay. I get that. I'm that way. And I've always been that way. In high school, I needed to be with the geeks, freaks, jocks, and student council politicians, and bristled whenever anybody tried to box me in. I still have that need, and I still bristle. When someone says, well, you don't sound black, I retort, well, yes, I do, because I am black. And this is how I sound. Which brings me to this life chapter, where law takes a back seat to music. And a lot of people have opinions about that. How could she leave Starbucks? Music is for the young. What are you, a rhythm and blues band? Oh, sure, she can do it. She's rich. And the beat goes on. Well, here's what I know. I know I'm a serious musician. I know I need to write music and share it. I want people to like 
the music. I want people to like me. I want people to like me. And this need I have is in harmony with an article I read. It's called The Selflessness of Self-Interest, and it's written by the CEO of the search firm, Corn Ferry. In it, the author says, we never graduate from sixth grade. As adults, our, our toys are different, and our games have bigger risk and reward. But we never leave the playground. We all want to be liked, loved, accepted. We want what other people have. We, we want to be popular. I want to win. The author is not being judgmental. He's just telling it like it is. Self-interest rules. And that's true whether I'm gay, straight, black, white, brown, rich, poor, red, blue, lawyer, or musician. Self-interest drives much of what I do, from where I live to the charities I support that make me feel good about myself, to those I love, how I love them, to the music I write and perform. The author goes on to say, though, when my self-interest connects with yours, and yours, and yours, and yours, and yours, and they combine for the good, whether it's for family, neighborhood, nation, or planet, this fusion of self-interest can fuel positive action just like what happened in South Africa. Now, I'm not so naive to think this happens intuitively or without effort, even at the family, workplace, or band stage. But I do think Within this notion of enlightened self-interest, there's a path to me seeing you as you truly are, and you seeing me as I want to be seen. And so, through enlightened self-interest, may we all know a little less so we may see a little more. Thank you. <laughs>